Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Collider Interviews YouTube channel for another exclusive interview. And I'm very excited about, you guys know this already, I can't get enough Fear Street. And right now, I've got Fear Street Simon on the channel, Fred Heschinger. Congratulations. Like, I don't, I don't have words to say this anymore. I'm so <laughs> obsessed with this series. I'm so happy for you guys. Congratulations. Thank you. I, I, it makes me very happy. And, and uh, I love that you're obsessed with it. Thank you. Before I get to Fear Street, I did want to go back to the beginning a little, just so everyone can get to know you a little more. And one of my favorite movies of 2018, eighth grade, and your scene in it is quite memorable. So looking back on filming that, is there anything about what Bo did to, you know, create a, a good environment on set or a way of working with you as an actor's director that makes you think like, that was such a great thing to have as one of my first big features? The whole, yes, the whole thing. I mean, one thing that was sort of simple thing, or not simple, but like it's never happened before or after. And it was really special to me. was like, I, I have a small part of that movie. And yet um, when I got cast, he let me read um, with other people who hadn't been cast yet. And in that we got to improvise and play and sort of find the character. And it was also really illuminating as an actor because it, you know, I auditioned for, all this time and, it, and, and and always sort of thought like, if I didn't get something, I like something was wrong with me and being able to, for him to sort of open the curtain and show that other side of the process was this incredible thing where like, just read with all these unbelievably amazing actors um, and, and they were all completely qualified and talented. And it was just this thing of like, finding the right mixture. So it wasn't, it, it just took an, it made it less moving on then I felt less, personal about um a lot of it and that was nice and then i don't know he's just he's i i will say like i've he it's one of that's one of my favorite scripts i'd ever read and and since then and now and what surprised me was still how um free he was with it like like i just want to do it word perfect because i thought it was word perfect and still Bo was very like just let everyone play at the same time like even though he was a writer director when he stepped on set as a director, he kind of became a, a, something else as well. So it was just this cool thing to see like how someone can build that entire thing. And I, I don't know, just like, there's so many lessons. It was also just how you treat people and, and, and make sure that people feel comfortable and open and know each other and all, all that kind of stuff that again, makes it so that like, you can, I, I just think we do our best. I think people do their best work when they feel safe and comfortable. That's when we can take risks. And he definitely made me feel like I could go for it. I am a very big believer in that as well. Speaking of which, so another movie that you are excellent in is News of the World. And I swear, like, what, what was it last year, early last year, I'm busy watching that movie and your sequences come up and I'm like, hmm, like, like, he's really good. He's something special. I'm going to see more of him. And sure enough, now this year, I get two things that you're in that I'm also obsessed with. So speaking of setting the right tone on set, you're busy working opposite, like one of the biggest of the big actors in Tom Hanks. What is something he did as a number one on the call sheet and a major leader in this industry on that set that makes you think when I'm going to lead my, you know, major Hollywood motion picture, I want to do that too. He saw like that every person on set made the thing what it is. And, and that meant that um, he spent time talking to everybody and getting to know everybody. Again, that, that sort of thing of like, you know, they'd be setting up a shot. Tom would be talking, like would be talking to everyone who was involved, you know, background artists and, and, and production crew. And, and just everyone was kind of, it was this combined thing. And like, like, I, I think, again, there's this, there was this thing that's not, that's not true. That's like, like, you can think that like, if you just like sanction off yourself and you like protect yourself, that you do the most true work. And in reality and watching him, it really was the opposite. It was like, we have to open ourselves up to each other. And that, that's not an impediment to, to, to doing honest and sometimes very, dramatic and and even dark work like like it, it, if if anything it makes it easier because people trust one another and and i don't know i just it was also like it's like it's as much your acting is the fun part like acting is is 
you know, you get to act like that's the joyous thing. Like that means that the rest of the work is sort of as an actor, it's, that's number one on the call sheet is, is, is making sure that everyone else is comfortable. That's, and that's also fun in its own way. But, but that like is, is equally important when you're at the top, I think is, is just, you know, making sure that, I don't know, the thing, the ship is moving and everyone's on board. And, and um, there was also a thing with Greengrass too, which was, we were really able to take our time and that's somewhat rare. Um, um, and uh, uh, it was really, really special. Like we would play with scenes inside and out till we felt that they were right. And it was really inspiring to be on a set and, and feel like that's, what's important. We can put the priority on our, um, on that feeling, on that, that feeling of being like right in the moment and trying to get that feeling right rather than just, hurrying all the time and getting the day. I, I, Greengrass is really brilliant at like, at, at letting the scene exist and trying, you know, throwing out the end of it and changing the order and seeing what that's like. like. Like just kind of the weird lab scientist beauty of like, how how can we get, how can we get this scene to sing? And it was just really, it was really wild. I, I remember very well that we did a scene one time and um, we like, you, you know, classically, like, you keep moving in, moving in. We, we, we started in, and then we moved, and then we thought we had it, and he moved out. But when we were, like, f- far wide of us on the wagon, we improvised a slightly different thing because we just kept playing. And Greengrass decided to move back in because he heard a few little lines that he hadn't heard before that he was like, oh, no, let's try that too. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, that's so liberating and, and thrilling and exciting to be able to, like, to be like, oh, wait, no, I'm, like, he was listening. He was always listening. Um, and, uh, I just thought that was, it was, it felt, I felt very honored to, to be with all of them and be a part of that. It, it was so cool. I could ask a million more questions about news of the world, but I'm obsessed with fear street. So I have yeah. to ask a million questions about that right now. Instead, beginning with the fact that si- Simon to me feels so incredibly specific to you. So what is the very first description of that character you got? Like the, the day one, what did that character look like? So I'm so curious to know how that changed when you stepped into the role. I don't remember the exact breakdown or the initial script. Um, but I do remember that, that in, in one of the original scripts, there was, um, like a comment on a perfume that he smelled like that he used like a cheap perfume that he used. And it was a specific brand. And the day that I had my, my um, audition with Lee, like the, like I'd send a tape and then it was an in-person audition with Lee. I'm not very superstitious, but I, but I, but I, but I really, really, really wanted this role. And I felt the real love of what Lee had written with Phil. And, and so I went to the, um, Dwayne Reed on my corner and I, I thought they had the little, they had the thing where like they lock, I don't know, like in pharmacy sometimes where they lock up perfume for some reason. I like, I don't know why it's the same price as the other things. I don't, I don't know if there were like these great perfume robberies, but anyways, it was locked up. And I remember like asking a guy like, oh, could you, would you mind? I never did that before. Like may you, may you unlock this glass case so I can buy this thing. And like, I was almost going to be late because it took away like 10 minutes. It took a while for him to get there and finally got it. And I like lathered myself with this thing very superstitiously. Um, and yet I found it some, I don't know, I found it helpful somehow. Um, but the other, I, the, Simon was always there in the script, but it was also a testament to, to Lee because, she, I mean, she, she really, and he, she really cares about the people in her movies. And I, 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 if you're a fan, I think like, I hope feel this thing, which is like, they're the gnarliest, you know, goriest, most unflinchingly horror movies ever. And at the same time, they have this like huge beating heart underneath them. And I, I think that comes from her care and her interest in character. And so I remember when we, before we started filming, we sat and we talked for like two hours about Simon and his life and our ideas. And there were many things that are in the movie that I think were unsaid by us that we both cared about, but there were also many things that we share that were fleshed out. And it was just, it's just this feeling when you, and I've, I've been lucky, like every director I've worked with, thank God has had this. And I think this is what, what's made me feel so honored to work with them, which is like this, this sort of love for character, this love for people, the people who actually exist in the frame. Um, um, and, and Lee just has that. And that's, I think what makes every character in, in this trilogy so specific and felt. 
you feel it while you're watching it. And that's a big part of the reason why I think Fear Street isn't just like a fleeting fun thrill for us to have now. That's that's a big part of the reason why I think it's an all time long lasting uh, trilogy we've got here. I was also wondering, did Lee give you any specific character references when playing Simon? Because I had a whole conversation with someone who tried to convince me that you've got some major stew from Scream vibes. And like, I can kind of see it, but but Stu's a bad guy. <laughs> so I'm pushing back on it a little bit. Yeah, thank you. We didn't we didn't talk. I mean, I rewatched Scream and watched all those wonderful 90s horror films. Um, there was no character reference, but there was a lot of um, there's a lot of just movie sharing back and forth, sort of. What about this? What about this in terms of kind of feeling? Um, um, there are a lot of there were a bunch of 90s gems that um, I hadn't seen that Lee put me onto that were really, really fun to watch in the lead up. It was the best of the bunch. I've never seen Go before. Um, oh, wow. I haven't thought about that movie in forever. <laughs> it was a really interesting, yeah, it was just a really interesting reference and really, really fun. It's funny with inspirations. It's like, I always have a couple things I'm carrying from movies that I love, but in, it's an, it's, it's such, it's so, it's like, it really is a, um, it's never, it, it, it's, it's kind of like, you just, it's nice to get inspired by something, but I always know that like, whatever the inspiration going into it, whether it's a real person or it's some form of research or it's a movie or a character in a movie, it always kind of, it's just the thing that leads you to set. And then it kind of fades away and you have to, you have to kind of let that preparation fade and become part of the movie. So, so like even the stuff that I love to watch that I was kind of like my calling card to rev me up, that stuff always be, that always goes, I always sort of forget it once the thing has been made um, in a way. That's why Simon feels purely you, like I said before. Thank you. Yes, thank you. What was it like making the transition from 94 to 1666? Did, did Lee ever have any conversations with you as far as how much of Simon should come through in that other character? We, I, I felt that that stuff was so, like wonderfully in the script that there was this thing where the, the characters are different in 1666, but there is, there are shared sensibilities. And there's also this shared struggle for the town of Shady Side that is, you know, people who have been pushed to the side, outcasts and misfits and um, the characters who in any other movie would die in the first 10 minutes are actually the, the, the heart and the essence of this film, um, this whole trilogy. And, and so, yeah, there was there was kind of like shared ideas and thoughts, but but there wasn't anything. It wasn't like like I, I do think of him as different, but I do think you know the way I think about it. It's like they're different people, but I think like if Isaac and Simon met, they get along, like they'd have a good time together. I think that's sort of the I shared thing of it. Yeah, <laughs> same with same with Kate and Lizzie. You know, it's like they're they're different, but but they're sometimes after similar things, and they would understand one another. One hundred percent. I would very much buy that. Just for fun, if you had a face off against one single shady side killer, one on one, which one of the bunch would you pick and why? Just talking about them sometimes gives me the chills. Billy Barker, that image of Billy Barker gives me it is gives me the most creeps, and I would want to fight him. I think I'd quickly probably lose, but I would still I would still pick him. Yeah, Billy Barker. I've been busy changing my answer like every sure. other day. I'm like trying sure. to find a yeah. loophole. The last one I said was uh, was the pastor, but I think oh. I'm only saying that because we only see the aftermath of what he's done. So I think in my brain, I'm I'm thinking I could run away from him, but I probably can't. I mean, that's risky. You you're you're asking to get your eyes gouged out. That's pretty fair. I feel like any of them are risky. Just in general, do you think you could survive a horror movie? Like, are are you? Yeah. Uh, are you are you the person that would that would be in the house with a slasher and run up the stairs and be doomed, or would you be you know the last one standing? Um, no, I, I I would. I mean, I'm just petrified. I would. I get scared of such minor things in life. I can't imagine like knowing that there's a killer like across the door. No, I would. I would. I would. I would totally fold under that pressure for sure. What have the others? Have the others said that they'd be the last? What did Kiana say? 
I, I did some uh, I did some cast superlatives with Kiana, and one of the questions was some, was something along the lines of, you know, like which cast member would be most likely to trip and fall while they're running away from a serial killer? Yeah, <laughs> I'm incredibly clumsy. I'm incredibly clumsy. I think she gave you that one, and also who would be most likely to drop something on their wardrobe while at craft services. <laughs> <laughs> I, had a, I had a day where I, so I can spoil stuff, right? Yeah, go crazy. Okay. So like in the, you know, in the third one where we come back at the end with he's uh, where um, good is haunted by the kind of like gory visions of all the people that he killed. Right. And they, they put all these prosthetics on me and it, it was like a, it was a weird mixture of like a, a lot of prosthetics and blood and scars and also this bald cap. So I looked like, I looked like an old man and like I had like, like sideburns that were all red and bloody Anyways, I was just like covered in all this stuff and yet they had nachos for, for lunch that day. And so it was just like, I couldn't, I was like, you just covered it. There's a picture of me where I'm like covered in blood and I'm eating the nachos and they're all combining to make this very weird, uh, <laughs> this very weird cauldron of, of um, different pastes and whatnot. And uh, oh, yeah, I would, I would, I would, I'm so messy. I'm a very messy eater. I'm a very clumsy person. I would fall at, um, I would definitely fall down. I would definitely fall into food. I, I, Kiana is totally right. <laughs> All right, here's a, here's a Fear Street Theory question for you. Right. Who do you think takes the book in the end? Oh, that's a great question. I'm, I'm not even gonna touch that one. That's, <laughs> that's... <laughs> I, I could tell you what she threw out there, which I, which I think is a, a fair theory that's, that's floating around and does, does have some like real substance to it. She, she suggested a uh, Ziggy, Ooh. which I can see. I, I can, I don't want that to happen because I like the feeling of closure that we get for that character. But at the same time, Kiana did point out that there's certain nuances in Gillian's performance that could maybe support that. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I mean, yeah, that's great. I, I think there are a couple options. Um, <laughs> Yeah. You dodging it? You, you can't no, if you want it. it. Well, no, Kiana really want, Kiana wrote in the group chat the other day, like, but seriously, guys, who grabbed that book? <laughs> and there was and no one touched it. It was radio <laughs> silence. Everyone was like, too controversial. I'm not, I'm not stepping in there. It's fair, it's fair. I'm impatient because I love this series, but I I, no, I love it. I love your it I love your ideas. I think if we we're all together at a table we could like argue all day about who it is. I think it's very exciting. There's a lot of, there's a lot of possibilities. I could go on and on. All right, White Lotus now. So this is gonna be hard because I've watched the whole thing. So I'm tempted to dig into all of it, but I'm gonna try to keep this to episodes one and two. So awesome. first, actually uh, like a somewhat silly question. Are you actually like listening to, watching or playing anything on the multitude of screens that he has? <laughs> That is a work. It's a working Nintendo Switch. Yes, I, I, um, I hadn't played Nintendo in like an incredibly long time. I used to in middle school every day we would play Super Smash Bros. and get a big thing of um, uh, fruit punch and we'd like share it for a week. Like if we buy fruit punch for the week, basically, and we do the same thing every day and we play this game. But I hadn't played it in like I don't know six years or something. And so getting it again on the Switch was uh, it was kind of fun to to step back in the old game, but yeah. Uh, so it is working, but um, it's, 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 it's hard to focus on video games when you're working with Steve Zahn. I mean, you just sort of want to take all that in rather than, rather than, the, than the screen. It is so good. Your back and forths are really just like, like spot on. It's such a, like, it's such a specific, like, style and tone and cadence also. And I imagine some of that can only come together in post-production with the score and the edit. But what can Mike White do for you as an actor's director on set in order for you to, like, you know, play the scene truly, but also kind of, like, tap into the satire of it all? Mike is this incredible um, combination as a writer and as a person, as a director on set. Um, which is that he he sort of is like unflinching in terms of the cringe of it, right? Like he will twist the knife to the furthest degree. Like he's just like, he's like ready to see, okay, most people would cut there, but like what happens after? And what happens after that? And what happens after that? Because like in life, we do not have the convenience of edits, you know? So often I'm in the middle of an interaction. I'm just like, oh no, what did I do? And you, you can't, you can't go to the next scene. You have to stay in it. 
and endure whatever is happening or however you've made this person uncomfortable or, or you feel uncomfortable or whatever it is. And I just think he's really unflinching with the cringe of it, but he's also really tuned into the, the, um, the kind of, um, he, he has a lot of compassion for, for the characters. And I, so I, I think that yields a certain empathy as a director to also um, see the story through their eyes. So like, um, for instance, that, that, that scene in the second episode, um, I remember a really wonderful note, or not even note, but like a wonderful thing that we were talking about before we did the scene was how like in Mark's eyes, when I agree to go scuba diving, that's like the end of the movie. That's like where the camera pulls back and it's this like victorious moment, you know? Um, and so, and again, like that's, I feel like Mike was able to see each of the character's story through their eyes. And then when you watch it, hope, I mean, the way that I feel when I watch the show is I just relate to everyone. And, and, and um, in the times that I like it and the times that I don't, I, re- I mean, in the times that I want to relate to them and the times that I'm a little embarrassed that I relate to them, but, but I do every single character. And I think, I think that comes with that, that combination, which is like, you, you, you can't sugarcoat it, but you also still have to have love. And as a director, he, he is that. I think about those in-between moments all the time. I think about what happens after, after a movie or show also with characters, because it's not like yeah. they walk off sunset they have a life and other challenges after but i also think a lot about oh before yeah yeah i I think about that too and in particular with quinn what is his life like before getting to white lotus is it as simple as like he is at home with his family with his head buried in the screens and if that is the case does he do that because the screens are so accessible to him or is it more so because the people around him push him into the screens yeah, that's a great, I, you know, I have, again, like I have my thoughts on everything, but I also, I feel that once it exists, I don't want to say too much in terms of that stuff, but, but I'm with you. Like, I really, I, the stuff that I really love, like you get, you get to know characters and through something and, and, and you do, they do sort of stick around in your head. And I, I, I feel that a lot. Like there, there are, there are a lot of movies where I, I don't know, for years after you sort of remember characters as if they're people that, you know, and that, that, that is something that I really, I really love. And, and I hope, I hope can keep, and it's, so that's cool. I, that's awesome. If you don't have to run off, I'm asking you one more Fear Street question. I was reading that you and Olivia have a little uh, movie trivia thing going on. Like what, what kind of movie trivia are we talking about? Are you asked, is you it like standard? The, have you ever played the movie game? What? Do, I've just, played variations of the you movie you game. Many, you're, you're clearly <laughs> tough, but like, I'm, I'm sure you've played much. many movie games, but what I, um, a game where you say um, an actor and then you say a movie that they're in and then you say another actor's in that movie and then you say another movie that that actor's been in. You play the, okay. So, and then you challenge and then you try and stump each other and you challenge each other. So yeah, we, we, um, we played that, you know, six months straight on set. And I will say it got heated sometimes. I mean, we had, we had a couple of car rides where, it, it was it, it's really fun to go at it I, I learned that game in camp like when I was in middle school and it's um um it was really fun to find someone who was um that eager to play it and that usually I try and play it and people are like okay I'm bored now and Olivia was like we just it was so fun we just went at it I've, I've played that version of it and also my family is obsessed with what we call the we call it the movie linking game where you just name two actors and you need to figure out like a way to craft a path from one to the other. It's like this person was in this movie with this and then you link it to the other person. I'll run this game by Olivia and we'll try and play it. If, um, yes, so yes. Sharing it. I, I'm curious who would who would come out on top in that game. All right. <laughs> I gotta let you go now. Fred, huge Thank congratulations you. to Thank everybody you so out there. Fear Street Trilogy. If you're here, you've already seen the whole thing, but watch it again on Netflix and also Sunday nights, HBO. It's where you can watch The White Lotus and it is excellent. Fred, congratulations. Thank you, Perry. It's nice to meet you. Thanks for for watching everything and, and thank you for your questions.